one of the downsides of electronic throttle control is engine failsafe mode. An indication like this tells you that the ETC or other systems, but predominantly the ETC is what we're seeing in the marketplace today, has detected a failure. Now, because there is no connection between engine speed and throttle operated by the operator of the vehicle, there's a great deal of time and effort gone into making sure whatever is going wrong in the electronic throttle will not result in unsafe operation. So as a result, anything that might be a minor problem in prior drivabilities with electronic throttle is going to wind up producing some very undesired results. Some of these results are long term and can be identified easily because they'll set a trouble code. Those will usually turn the fail safe light on you see here. However, there are some intermittents that are going undetected by a great many service outlets. We're going to have to address those problems where you do not have a code, but you do have a performance problem. To put it in a succinct manner to start you off, we're going to have to go deep enough to understand the system to understand what a glitch would do to the engine performance, even though the glitch may be too short-lived to change and set a trouble code and put us into failsafe mode. And we'll talk about the three different levels of failsafe. Let's talk about what we're going to be doing. First of all, I'm going to introduce you to how they all work, and it's going to be a compendium type program, imports and domestics, and we're going to discuss the different systems that are being used by those manufacturers. And then we're going to identify the throttle components and the testing of each of these components. And we're going to gain an understanding of the operation because the way to test them without codes is to thoroughly understand the operation. And understand we're going to have to relearn conditions for throttle control when changes are made to the vehicle, like disconnecting the battery. And we're going to select the correct diagnostic procedure to use with a code or without a code. We're going to be addressing both types of situations. Now, we've had electronic throttle back as early as the 80s. It was a simple motor that moved the throttle shaft. Yes, it wasn't exactly what we have today. It's being used widely on diesels, of course. And today's versions are much more reliable than they have been. And they have a thing we're going to beat up on constantly through this program called redundant path software. We're going to look at two different situations and verify that they're working properly. And we're going to combine all this with variable valve timing, direct injection, and electronic stability control, and talk about how these pieces come into play with electronic throttle. Because it's important to understand electronic throttle is used with other things. We have two basic types of systems. Here's one overall that's showing it with an electronic control, electronic control throttle module, an ECT module. Now don't get confused by the abbreviation ECT. Whatever reason, General Motors picked that identification. We've always used it for engine coolant temperature. In this case, it's electronic controlled throttle. One of the jokes going around the industry is that Ford called it electronic throttle control. ETC and GM never liking to do what Ford does, called it ECT just so they wouldn't be copying Ford. Whatever the case is, don't let it throw you. Because most of the systems you'll be seeing are going to be working something along this line, whether they're one or the other. We're going to get an input from the accelerator pedal, which is the ETC, ECT module in this case is going to go over and control the motor. And it's going to get feedback. But actually, that control isn't what you think it is. The control is really between the PCM and the ECT. The ECT basically does the heavy lifting for the PCM, runs the motor, gets the feedback, sends the information through a serial communication link back to the PCM. Now, understanding that if we lose serial communication, the ETC module will not control throttle 
for the engine will only idle. Why is that important? It's important that you understand that the PCM is making most of the decisions. The ETC is merely executing what the PCM wants done. So, whatever happens, we can got to learn how to divide these systems. If the logic is wrong, it's in the PCM. If the execution is wrong in controlling the motor, it could be in the ECT or the motor itself. The newer systems, which most vehicles are going to have, are going to have no external module. They're going to have a PCM controlling the motor, looking at the TPS for a feedback signal, and they're going to go to the motors, makes his input. The PCM compels the motor to drive in or drive out, positions it, verifies that position with a TPS signal, and then makes any corrections necessary. All the decision and all the work is done at the PCM. Now, regardless of which system you have, you're going to have redundant path software. We've got a self-testing processor. That is just looking to see what's going on to make sure everything is what it should be. And we'll talk about how it analyzes the signal. And we've got self-testing software also looking at all this. It's going to send data through a serial link, internal if it's in the PCM, external if it's an external system, over to the ETC software that resides in the PCM when it's a PCM only. So it can be either internal or external. But inside the PCM, we're going to have the ETC software and the PCT and the PCM software. If we have an external system, we're going to have the self-testing processor in the external module. So here's what's going to happen. The throttle pedal is going to move. And that signal is going to go to the self-testing processor, which is going to fold it on through the serial data after it's examined and found that it's a reasonable signal. And it's going to look at feedback. We usually have redundant two signals, not just one. Why do we have redundant signals? Because we want to make sure that we understand the correct position of the throttle. Of course, this is a standard sensor supplied by 5 volts, and we have two brake switches that are going to be sending information in. Brakes are going to become important now because they're going to work like speed control. They're going to tell us when we need to stop the vehicle, regardless of where the throttle is. And we're going to be utilizing the injection fuel system inputs to tell us what kind of engine loads we have, so we can couple that load with throttle position in the PCM can use its software to make a decision on properly positioning the throttle itself. Then we're going to have the ETC outputs. We're going to have a DC motor. We're going to go over and drive that motor. We're going to have an ETC disabled. Something goes wrong in the self-testing software. It's going to send a signal saying, hey, we got a problem. Bring the car back to idle. Do not let it come off idle. It will disable the ETC. If the problem is okay, it's going to send the signal back to saying everything is fine with software. Use the feedback and gather the information. And the feedback, again, goes to the self-testing processor. So we've got a processor that's doing nothing but continuously looking at the signals. That's something that's important to understand and is going to be very important to our diagnostic process. As we said earlier, electronic throttle control system doesn't provide benefits by itself. The benefits are realized when there's a total control of the engine. Now it can provide different benefits by improving emissions and here's the way it does that. The red is the accelerator pedal rising quickly as the customer steps in the car very hard. Remember this is in milliseconds, thousands of a second. In one-tenth of a second, we've gone from idle to wide open throttle with the accelerator pedal. But the blue line shows the gradual opening of the throttle as done by electronic throttle control. So the throttle opening is delayed slightly to allow time for fuel and spark to increase with throttle opening. It's a very smooth transition. Now, unfortunately, 
where Harry Hot Rod, or somebody who likes sharp performance off the line, this 30 or 40 milliseconds is a throttle lag. The average motorist, motorist never even notices this throttle lag, but it is there. We're going to show you some proposals that are going to be improving that throttle lag situation in the near future, and hopefully that can be fixed. This is one of the customer objections, and it's something you need to be aware of when they say their throttle's not working right, you've got to look at your customer's driving habits and ask the question, are you expecting jackrabbit starts or are you having a real problem where you step on the gas and there's a significant delay long enough it becomes a safety issue? And uh, that's important. Now, some cars, like the Corvette, has a switch so you can cut this delay out and it's almost instantaneous, but that's in a sports car environment, and you'll be seeing more and more of that because we'll talk about that a little later. Here's what happens when we graph scan data and the improved emissions. Why are emissions better? Because we don't have to throw a bunch of fuel at the system to get it going. We allow it to build speed and add fuel as the speed increases. Prior to this, we had saw a water throttle. We threw a bunch of fuel and a lot let the engine catch up to the fuel. We don't do that anymore with electronic throttle. Part of the improvement in uh, gas mileage and emissions. So here we are as our pedal going up quickly. We see it over there. We saw this in scan data. That's how I went out and made that graph you just looked at. We graphed it on a graphing uh, multimeter and said, hey, we can measure the milliseconds. On a cable throttle, remember, we would have gone straight up, but with a new one, we don't. Altitude compensation can be done. We're looking at this and saying, oh, the red is where we would expect it to be. The white is where the revised throttle opening is. Normally, we'd expect to see the throttle opening a little ways. We revise it open wider because of high altitude operation. Opening a little wider, giving us a little more airflow. So we've got an revised and increased airflow over what we would anticipate for a normal operation at lower altitudes. Engine and vehicle speed governing. Now this sounds strange, but it's not. Speed governing is vehicle speed control. Engine speed governing is just warm up. And we're going to be doing some other things we'll be talking about as we get into some of these other systems and tying this all together. So we're driving along here, and we have decided that speed should be lower than the 68 miles an hour we would normally expect with 92% throttle. What you're looking at here is speed governing that takes place during electronic stability control. Electronic stability control is going to be using the ABS brakes, which is subject of another class. We found that most people don't understand enough about ABS brakes to fully understand how it's integrated into vehicle speed control. So we're going to be doing a class talking about the various components of analog brakes and how they work. But the analog brakes are going to be braking one wheel momentarily. But the other action, specifically, related to electronic throttle, is it's going to back the electronic throttle off slightly to reduce the speed. Now it's doing this as part of an overall program where we've got yaw rate sensors, yaw being the amount of, of twist and turn, departure from normal attitude, indicating we may be entering or on the verge of entering a skid. It's going to, the computer is going to break one brake on one of the corners to bring it back to the desired angle of direction and reduce the yaw and at the same time the electronic throttle is going to bring the throttle back slightly to give us better stability. These are all made very quickly, very fast and without the customer's input. Since it's without the customer's input, it's called speed governing. Yes, we are doing something the customer did not ask for. However, 
let's take a moment to talk about this. One of the advantages of electronic throttle and vehicle speed control and electronic stability all brought together is that electronic stability utilizing part of the ABS and part of the electronic throttle control has reduced the number of roll accident, rollover accidents in SUVs by 50%. In Europe, they estimate that the overall number of single car accidents have declined by 30% on those vehicles equipped with vehicle stability. And as we said earlier, electronic throttle is part of a bigger picture of new things coming. You've got to understand electronic throttle and ABS. Then we can have a very short class when you have those two under your belt to understand electronic stability control. So these are all things we're talking about. And idle air control is we're going to take over cold idle and warm the car up. That can help lower our emissions, believe it or not. Here's an example. We're going to accelerate a pedal of 10%, but the throttle position is 15. This is a typical reading we get on a cold startup. We have cruise control, part of our vehicle speed governing. We're sitting here. We've got the right amount of throttle. We have not moved our foot. It's a 10%, yet the system is opened up to give us 57 miles per hour. For future applications, Engineers are promoting the idea of giving the driver additional control of the engine's performance. Some of the things they're looking at is to modify the response of the accelerator inputs. We've touched on this slightly by saying that Corvette already allows you to make a choice in how much input you have to the accelerator and how fast that happens. So what they're looking at is having normal for the average person, power, for the hot rodder and winter for safety concerns. Let's break these down individually. Normal is a default setting we normally have, and that provides the accelerator response that most drivers prefer for most driving conditions that yields improved emissions and an improved gas mileage. Power is the case where the driver desires additional performance. The power switch is selected and the ATC gains become more aggressive, aggressive. The result is a sporty feel, especially at launch off the line. In winter, winter mode is selected by the driver in low traction conditions where fine control of power is needed. For instance, on icy roads, we all see the first part. The winter mode results in a very conservative throttle gains such as the power may be easily modulated without wheel slip. Now, think of wheel slip in two directions. Not only do we not want to accelerate quickly on ice, we also do not want to decel quickly on ice. So this can help modify our driving in winter. All related to safety. Everything here we're talking about is safety. Safety is critical for any electronic throttle control system. And fail-safe operations is absolutely required. Remember, the only connection between engine speed and throttle, the accelerator I should say, is electronics. We've got a lot of electronic signals interpreting the desired speed the motorist is requesting. The fail-safe system must focus on, dete must focus on detecting operational problems and respond in a specific way to compensate for them if they go wrong. Some manufacturers are also going to store min and max values in their throttles and to learn idle air and other throttle characteristics of all the memory, which is going to require that we relearn some stuff if things happen. Now, all manufacturers store learned air values in volatile memory. That means it knows what it needs to idle tomorrow morning when you start your car up and it's 30 degrees outside. But let's look at what this relates to. The scan tool is the easiest way to relearn if you have the software available for your scan tool. Now we say that because a lot of 
scan tools have to be factory scan tools in order to do the relearn process right now, but we expect to see that expanding rapidly. There are manual procedures in Mitchell and Alday, however, if you need to do it manually. But we want to take a minute to show you what a manual is. Manual relearn process. We're going to pick something. We're going to also tell you that sometimes you have to repeat the relearn procedure several times. We've had several vehicles who've had to do it. Not enough we want to name vehicles. Let's look at the procedure. Then maybe you'll understand why sometimes it's going to be necessary to repeat these manual learn procedures. Now, this is going to be required after disconnecting the battery. Now, one way to keep this from happening is use a jumper pack plug into the lighter to keep memory power if you're going to have to disconnect the battery for service. But when you do that, remember that positive lead you have flopping around out under the hood is live. It's being powered by the jumper pack. If you do throttle clean, we have found with changing throttle, uh, uh, idle speed so drastically, it's caused it. One of the problems we've seen with throttle cleaning is people trying to force the throttle open. We're going to talk more about that later. Do not force this throttle. It's not just a spring-driven throttle any longer. We'll show you about that. We're going to gather as much information about these and other problems as we can to try to tell you where people are going wrong, and we'll be putting that up on the Internet for you to see. Here is a relearn example one for a Volkswagen. This is part one of a three-part system. With the accelerator pedal release, we're going to be doing the accelerator pedal release position learning. Step one. Make sure the accelerator pedal is fully released, not connected, not bound up in the carpet. Turn the ignition switch, ignition switch to the on position for two seconds. Then turn the ignition switch to the off position for 10 seconds. Then turn the ignition switch to the on position for two seconds. Then turn the ignition switch to the off position for 10 seconds. This is going to set us up to relearn throttle position. So part two, we're going to perform the throttle valve closed learning. Again, making sure the accelerator pedal is fully released. Turn the ignition switch it on, then turn it off for 10 seconds. Listen for the sound of the throttle motor positioning the throttle during the 10 second off time. What we've done is that first step has told it we want to go into a closed throttle learning mode. So what it's going to do is drive the throttle mode open, drive it closed, and you'll hear it run. Then you're ready for step three. Step three is start the engine and bring the engine up to normal operating temperature. Now you may want to break out a stopwatch or some of this because it gets crazy. With it running, with it up to temperature, everything is fine. We're going to turn the ignition off for 10 seconds. With the throttle fully released, turn the ignition switch on for three seconds. Fully depress and release the accelerator pedal five times in five seconds. Begin to see why it may take you two or three times through to get this. Wait seven seconds, then fully depress the accelerator pedal and hold it to press for about 20 seconds. The mill light will stop blinking and stay on when the test is finished and you can release the throttle. Now, what we dislike about this procedure is back in, in the, uh, the example of, of step two, the mill light was blinking. Now, we have stopped it from blinking. Wait seven seconds, then fully depress the accelerator pedal. The mill light will go out when the test is complete. Release the throttle. Now, you can start and idle the engine. After 20 seconds, rev the engine up and down several times to be sure the throttle and ignition timing are working well. If the throttle ignition time are wrong, more testing is required. You may have to go back and repeat this test. Now, we don't want you to try to memorize this. You could not possibly remember this stupid thing. But what I want you to understand is not all cars are alike. Let's look at a Cadillac. Here's example two of a Cadillac ECT. You may have to relearn. To relearn, 
turn the ignition switch to the run with the engine off and stay in the run position for three minutes. Turn the engine off, start and idle the engine for 30 seconds. Turn the engine off and restart. The procedure is complete. You should have relearned idle position. The reason to let it idle for 30 seconds is we've got it all ready over three minutes. Turned it off, started and ran it. It's going to relearn in that 30 seconds and then you can restart. The point we're making is use the specific procedures and follow all of this time. So, one of the common complaints you're going to be hearing about. We were touching on those. The common complaints is, you worked in my car and it doesn't run right. Go back and relearn it. Other common complaints. Throttle lag, which is defined as the delay in engine response. And it's stall it stops. Do you treat both these the same? Remember, the top one may simply be a customer looking for jack rabbits. Stall it stops may mean you need to go back and do that relearn procedure. The reason we showed you that relearn, stalling it stops, usually indicates the relearn procedure was not learned. Bad hesitation frequently results of not relearning everything. Sudden lunge, especially following a cold startup. We see this sometimes, and we'll talk about it when we get into details of diagnostic. We have seen cars with this, and the motorist is really afraid of it. And we'll show you what we found. Engine will only run at idle. This is usually an indication of we either lost communications in a split system, or we have an external module, or we simply don't know what to do because we've got some bad complaints. Look for service codes in this particular case. Engine runs only at low RPMs. This is limited power. It could be very likely that you're in a reduced power because of the lost information and inability of ETC to perform at normal operating safely. No response from accelerator pedal. Probably means things are wrong with ETC and it doesn't know what to do, so it'll do nothing. Unintended acceleration is the dreaded word every manufacturer hates to hear. This is the one they all fear, and this is the one all the sleazebag lawyers, the ambulance chasers, are looking for. If they can ever identify unintended acceleration, they know they have a rich lawsuit with millions of cars out there. They can advertise on TV and get filthy rich. Hesitation when the engine accelerates too fast. This is something wrong. Hesitation, then all of a sudden it catches up. We'll show you some of the causes for this. Too much to complain about right now. Jerkiness. Unintended DXL. That is just as bad. More than 1,000,000, 2002 and 2003, Toyota Camry, Solars, and the Lexus 300Ss were involved in an investigation of unintended complaints. The complaint narrowed to 11 complaints of ending surge, which five were involved in a crash. Toyota, Toyota was not found responsible for any of them. One of the things you have to be aware of is every time a customer steps on the gas, instead of the brake, and the car accelerates, they're going to try to blame the car. The Audi A6 had 16 driver complaints about the engine for picking up speed without throttle movement. This is still under investigation. Here's the official report. July 27, 2004. The National Highway Safety Transportation Administration closed their case and cannot find anything. Only one pedestrian was injured in one of the crashes where the vehicle sped up and hit a pedestrian. So, there's a lot been done. What we're putting this in here for is so you are aware that there's a lot of lawyers out looking for something wrong with electronic throttle. When you service electronic throttle, you need to be aware of this. Now let's go back and start talking about the components.